The Fairchild Republic A-10 Thunderbolt II, commonly called the Warthog, has built a cult following for a very good reason. This two-part video is here to explain the plane's early history. I can explain that history because I was there. I served as a crew chief briefly within a year of the airplane's introduction. I later became an A-10 instructor pilot. I also wrote a book, An Oral History of Desert Storm, that includes two chapters on the A-10, and I have a patent on a civilian version of that airplane. So hang on, you're about to get a real snort from the fire hose of information. You can read this overview, but the point is, why was this airplane built in the first place, and uniquely to this thing, why is it just so damned ugly? In here, you'll also see a dogfight on head-up display video and a couple of issues that I'm certain you have no clue on. Stick around. The American Air Force was dragged late and reluctantly to this issue. World War II saw several specialized close air support airplanes like this Stuka. The Luftwaffe built a flying specialized tank optimized for close air support. It was an extremely specialized dive bomber and often carried those two huge 37 millimeter cannons under the wings. The Luftwaffe also put close air support specialists on the ground with their army and developed tactics that are still being used today. The Russians developed a very similar airplane called the Sturmovik. It closely resembles the Stuka because it flew the same missions for the same reasons. The Allies really didn't learn much from their experience on the receiving end. They went through World War II and the Korean War using piston-driven fighters in a close air support role that they really weren't designed for. You fast forward to Vietnam, and the best the American Air Force could do was convert a Navy passenger airplane into the A-1 Sky Raider. This is where the story gets really ugly. It's also the point where you can start to see why Air Force leadership has tried to get rid of the A-10 since the day where they were forced to build it. The American Army's leadership was seriously fed up with a lack of close air support, so they decided just to do it themselves. They weren't allowed to build fixed-wing airplanes like the Sky Raider, so they built this conglomeration called the Cheyenne that was part helicopter, part auto gyro, and part pusher airplane. The Cheyenne was seriously capable, seriously expensive, and also a threat to the Air Force's new airplane money. That money threat finally coerced the Air Force's leadership into building a close air support only jet for the Army. Fast forward 50 years, and the Army is developing another pusher helicopter. Could it be that the Army anticipates losing the A-10s? Hmm. A glance at these late 1960s variant of the Huey helicopter show that the transport systems will eventually end up in a gunship. Expect that to happen with this new development as well. Anyway, the Army's credible attempt to take close air support away from the Air Force convinced the brass that they finally had to build a dedicated close air support attack jet, do nothing else, similar to the Stuka and Sturmovik. The early 70s, therefore, saw a competition between something called the A-9 and the something else called the A-10, the A-10-1, and there it is. Another former hard driver buddy of mine described that process as the Air Force throwing a temper tantrum. The cannon was new and the Maverick missiles were designed for this airplane, but nothing else is innovative on the jet. It was designed without even the rudimentary inertial navigation systems and computing gun sights that other early 70s jets had. This jet obviously doesn't look like anything else in the Air Force inventory, so how did it get to be so ugly? In this case, ugly boils down to a design concern that is solely about function and not at all about form or appearance. With no functions that require a sleek, pointy, fast airplane, 
It doesn't look like any of its peers you see here. Their missions all require speed, so they have pointy noses, small wings, swept tails, and generally look fast because they are. That close air support mission requires staying very close to the troops, perhaps within three miles, and being able to see well enough to sort them out from the bad guys. It turns out that real-world testing, which I was part of, proves that you really can't cruise above about 350 knots and fly close air support. Turn rate and radius are far more important than cruise speed, so the A-10 has a big, fat 1930s wing that performs really well in one place. In other words, this airplane is optimized for the slow speed turning fight and nothing else. This jet was designed for the close-in visual fight. Imagine a street brawl with depleted uranium cannon shells. That means the design needs great visibility. When you sit in the A-10 cockpit, it's actually like you're not really in an airplane. The cockpit is very far forward, has lots of glass, and looks over a short stubby nose you really can't see from the inside. Here's how all of that came together in the high threat World War III environment of the Cold War. As background, really high threat, like the Russians, drives attack airplanes really low. I taught my students to fly entire attack missions below 300 feet, take off to landing. Here's some old school video to illustrate that point. The cannon sight is that cross near the center top. You will hear the forward air controller on the ground, plus me in this jet. Got several movers on the road, one tank, 500 meters east of reviewing stand. Off your nose, half mile away. Nice pass, one. Watch out for that visual two. Who's up and in? Tally ho, two. Off your nose. Guns down. Guns down. Off left, Chuck. Nice pass, one. Watch out for that visual two. Who's up and in? Tally ho, two, off your nose. Guns down. Guns down. Off left, Chuck. Furnace egress west. Copy, egress west. A chatter, we're gonna have to be RTB for time. Roger, copy 506 Alpha, great work, great work, thank you. Working that close in requires a point-blank weapon, which, on the hog, is a huge Gatling gun. This rather famous photo shows the 19-foot-long, 4,000-pound gun next to a VW. The hog was quite literally designed around that cannon. In other words, the requirement to stay with the troops quite literally drove the aircraft's design. There seems to be quite a fascination with this gun, so let's spend a couple seconds talking about how it works. This is a real dummy cannon shell from that 30 millimeter gun. And no, the hog does not really shoot silver bullets. It's just that the only real one I have happens to be a trophy. The entire shell is just under 12 inches long and shoots that projectile you see there just to the right. That spent bullet is a real training round that has been through the gun, as you can see by the rifling marks on the gas band. When it was fired, it had a windscreen on the front, which is the pointy end of the bullet, that was stripped off when it hit the ground. All of the bullets weigh about a pound and move at about 3,300 feet per second. That bullet on the far right is a common 50 caliber. I call it common, but please remember that thousands and thousands of aircraft in World War II were shot down by that bullet. Finally, consider the recordings you've heard about the A-10 cannon firing. If the observer is in the right place, you actually hear two sounds. One is the ordinary muzzle blast from the gun. The other sound are the mini sonic booms from that big fat bullet going by at Mach 3. How does that beast of a cannon perform in real life? Let's take a look. Here's one of those low altitude attacks you saw earlier filmed through the infrared camera on a Maverick missile. 
This is the run-in to the attack at an artificially high 300 feet above the ground. The pop-up attack starts with a straight pull, a roll toward the target, roll out, and shoot. Here it is again in slow motion. Each of those moving white dots on the upper left side is a bullet. Any two of those rounds would have killed a Russian tank. See, that's fine, Bravo. You're clear enough. The hog is designed with as few single point failures as possible, but there are a couple that are unavoidable. One of those possible failures is the pilot, so he or she is surrounded by 1,500 pounds of titanium, which is not armor plate, it's actually just beefed up structure made of titanium. Where the flight controls necessarily come together, like back there in the tail, they're also contained in titanium armor. The canopy and that flat piece of glass in a very sturdy frame are part of the armor. The plastic canopy will deflect any machine gun round, and that glass in front of the pilot will... Um, I can't talk about that. The best I can say for illustration is that I was perfectly happy to go head-on, cannons only, against any fighter in the sky. The combination of titanium, the canopy, and the glass means, to the best of my knowledge, no hog driver has ever been injured inside the cockpit. That specifically means no missile, no anti-aircraft shell, no mid-air collision, and certainly no bird strike has ever penetrated the cockpit. These flight controls are so redundant that it's possible to carve eight feet off of either wing and the tail on that side and kill the engine on that side and the jet will still fly. Anti-aircraft missiles are not designed to actually hit airplanes. They want to blow up near an airplane and spray perhaps 500 really fast, really hot pellets into the jet. That huge, basically, shotgun blast is designed to cut hydraulic lines and fuel lines near engines so that the jet burns rather than gets blown to pieces. Knowing that, the HOGS designer separated the self-sealing fuel tanks from the externally mounted engines, so that just wouldn't work. Speaking of those engines for a second, they are 1960s technology high bypass turbofans, meaning that 80% of their thrust comes from those big fan blades you see in the front. That's why the A-10 sounds a whole lot more like a transport or an airliner, which has the same kind of engine, than it does the pointy nose fighters of its era. While such engines were the best the designers could do for fuel efficiency and loiter time, it also left the plane really gutless. It has a horrible thrust to weight ratio. As you saw earlier, the Cold War hogs flying in Central Europe had to fly really, really low. Since the Air Force has always been led by fighter pilots, they looked down on hogs and thought, okay, they need to look like trees. That led to this brown and green paint scheme that you can see against a European forest. That would certainly have worked against other fighter pilots like the Russians, but it really was a horrible idea given that almost all of the threats of the A-10 looked up from the ground. We thankfully never fought World War III in Central Europe, but those really dark hogs did go to Desert Storm. That experience proved two things. The hogs were stunningly effective. They were also very easy to see and target. Here's my friend PJ's hog, which took a shoulder-fired SA-16 missile into the right wing. He flew that hog back to base and later to South Carolina, where it is now a static display. 
Even after they were repainted in the original, pretty useless gray paint scheme, hogs still get hit. Killer Chick took one of those fragmenting warheads in the tail over Baghdad. The fragments took out both of her hydraulic systems, but if you remember that titanium armor back there, it did not sever her flight controls, so she flew it back to base. Air Force leadership has always hated the A-10 simply because they were forced to buy it to support the Army. So, those leaders have retired as many A-10s as they possibly could. As a result, fewer than 300 of the original 750 remain in service. Here are 222 of those retired A-10s stored in the desert near Tucson, Arizona in the early 1990s. The Air Force destroyed all of those jets, refilled that spot with more A-10s, and destroyed those too. I'm not qualified to speak on today's A-10s, so let's summarize that they have turned into the most feared jet in the low threat wars in the Middle East. They fly with their original decades-old gray paint scheme, which is a whole lot better than that dark, almost black stuff they flew with in Desert Storm, but is still not great. What is great, however, is that the Air Force opened up all fighter assignments to women, meaning that we can now tap into talent from wherever we can find it to fly the Warthog. For a jet that is huge, it's about 55 feet square, it is amazingly maneuverable. That proved especially useful and fun in dogfights against the pointy-nosed fighters. Those fighter pilots were essentially stunned the first time they took on an A-10, one versus one. Here's some gun camera film from one such encounter. The F-16 pilot had never seen an A-10 before and had actually never seen or fought an airplane that could turn better than he could. As you watch this clip, keep in mind that 70 30 millimeter cannon shells pass through the dash circle every second. Those are the well-known issues you can hear pretty much anywhere. I mentioned camouflage earlier, but there is much more to that story. Anti-aircraft gunners and hog drivers recognized instantly that the A-10 was really easy to see from the ground. Here's a newspaper photo from the early 1980s proving that the hog was essentially a black silhouette. This quote comes from a fellow hog driver and my friend, call sign Coke, who fought Desert Storm. It comes from an oral history of the air war in Desert Storm, published just after that war. We wanted to paint the jets some sort of sand color like the Brits did, but we were told, no, 
shut up, sit down, no, no, no. Our squadron leadership got really ticked because we kept asking them about that obvious need. I don't know if they were directed from higher than the wing level or what, but changing camouflage made sense. We could be seen from well over 10 miles away in the desert. Several of the New Orleans jets were repainted before they deployed, but then somebody higher got wind of that and said, paint them back or you're not taking them. Camouflage was one of our big after-action gripes since it was a big factor in our losses. Dark jets were a lot easier to see. Every A-10 that got hit was hit by an optically aimed weapon, even if it was terminally guided by something else. It didn't have to be that way. How do I know? Two years before Koch fought that war in an essentially black silhouette jet, I tried to change the camouflage into something based on science. Keith Ferris, a stunningly talented aviation artist, also holds a pile of patents on camouflage. He tolerated me when I tried to change the camouflage in an earlier airplane I flew, the OV-10 Bronco, and then again when I flew the A-10. The science behind his designs is way too complicated for this explanation, but trust me, this stuff just hurts your eyes. It's so good. Keith sent this proposal. My squadron loved it. My wing loved it. We sent it back to the Pentagon for approval to paint a couple of test jets and ran into that no, no, no. In other words, the hog drivers going to Desert Storm unknowingly stepped on the landmine I created by trying to improve the A-10's camouflage less than two years earlier. I learned the hard way that the Air Force had actually stolen part of Keith's design, that dark spot underneath the canopy, got sued, lost, and then blacklisted everything he did regarding camouflage. That means that because the bureaucrats were miffed, we missed out on this again roughly two years before A-10s got shot down because they were the wrong color. If the chair flying desk jockeys back in the Pentagon had acted in our interest instead of their own, A-10s would have looked like this during Desert Storm and afterward. That extreme bias against the scientifically based Ferris designs among the combat leaders did not extend to the training command. Here you see a T-37 and then a T-38 painted in Ferris high visibility designs meant to improve their safety rather than hide the jets. Feeling the heat from the A-10 losses to optically aimed weapons, Air Force brass went back into the A-10's history and dug out this simple gray paint scheme. It's really just gray. Its uh, colors are too close together to really be called camouflage, but it does have that spot under the canopy that the Air Force was forced to pay for when they lost that lawsuit over patent infringement. This current headline shows that the Army is starting to move serious Cold War units back into Europe. Now that we're shifting back to an emphasis on a near-pure fight with maybe Russia or China, perhaps today's leaders will get it right. We'll see. Remember that earlier photo showing 222 trashed A-10s? Well, the Forest Service leadership and air tanker company people looked at that and said, hmm. That thing is the most maneuverable, most accurate aircraft ever built. Let's use it to fight fire. And that's actually a really neat idea. Wish I'd come up with that one myself. So the people who are fighting fire with literally 1940s and 1950s airplanes came up with a couple of designs you see here to turn the A-10 into a 1950s air tanker. I say that because they were going to take out the ejection seat, take out the avionics, the bombing systems, stick a conventional drop door on the bottom, and call it good. They would have built airplanes like this, which, while they look good, would not have worked. Why not? Well, it turns out retardant, that pink stuff you see falling out of air tankers on TV, 
has a speed limit of about 150 nautical miles per hour. If it's dropped any faster than that, the air blasts the retardant into that ineffective pink mist you see just drifting uselessly away from the fight, doing nothing. I'm sorry, that's not exactly accurate. The ineffective pink mist actually wastes capacity because some large percentage of each drop is useless. Those conventional thinkers also plan to take out the bombing systems because they thought they were too hard to maintain. That means they would have aimed like they always did, TLAR. That looks about right. When a few hog drivers applied our experience to the problem, we came up with this. That tank on the bottom carries 2,000 gallons of retardant, but it's actually that pipe extending backwards that's the real story here. Rather than just dumping the retardant in the air to be shredded by the slipstream, it's actually propelled backwards at about 80 knots. That allows the hog to drop at about 200 knots airspeed, which the wings need to stay in the air, while the retardant only sees about 120 knots of wind well below its limit. You can't see most of the internal improvements or engine upgrades on this model, of course, but you can see that ball under the nose. That ball is a gimbaled infrared camera with the image projected inside the visor. That meant the Firehog driver could see in infrared anywhere that gimbal could point, including down through the floor. Infrared vision is significant because it cannot see smoke particles. In other words, it's not blinded by the smoke cloud. That was 1994 and anticipated today's IR vision systems, such as on the F-35. That little probe you see sticking out of the nose is actually an aerial reloading system, so this aircraft could have reloaded retardant in flight and not had to land to reload. Leadership in the California Department of Forestry and the U.S. Forest Service rejected this because it was too much for them. I'll bet they wish they had it now. Expressed sarcastically, if a government would spend hundreds of millions to unburn places like the Oakland Hills or Paradise, California, then why wouldn't they spend tens of millions to prevent those fires in the first place? So the bottom line is that Firehog idea died a bureaucratic death in the late 90s. Because deja vu is a real thing, here's a headline from February 2020. The Air Force wants to get rid of A-10s yet again. If you think maybe it's time to revisit that air tanker idea, put something in the comments below. <coughs> to summarize, the Warthog is just butt ugly for many really good reasons. It was on the chopping block to be eliminated until Desert Storm happened, which saved it. The low threat wars that followed Desert Storm proved the concept in a really solid way to the point where killing the A-10 fleet has proved impossible for the Air Force brass. As good as the jet is, it could be better. It suffers from the same bureaucratic sicknesses that affect uh, maybe some other parts of our government too. Look up these titles on YouTube if you want to see how the jet performs today. Well, that's it. I hope you learned something, and I'll leave you with just a little bit of advice. Fly safe, but not too safe.